The Chicago Digital Accessibility and Inclusive Design Meetup presents Where Does UX and Accessibility Meet? with Richard Douglas. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here and uh, for, giving me, uh, for giving me some of your time. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been involved in the user experience field for a little over 16 years or so. I've spent time on uh, in big companies on internal teams, like Dennis just mentioned. Uh, for about the last four or five years, I've been doing uh, independent work, uh, freelancing, uh, contract work as well. Worked in a number of different settings, a number of different companies. Um, had an opportunity to uh, work in all different kinds of verticals with all different kinds of situations. Uh, when, you, when I'm not doing user experience work, you'll usually find me outdoors. Uh, that's me and my oldest son. We got to spend five days on the Appalachian Trail a couple years ago uh, in the Tennessee, North Carolina area. Uh, we're on top of Big Bald Mountain there, which is a pretty cool place. On a clear day, you can see most of the southern Appalachian mountain range, which is pretty cool. See, if I'm not doing this, I'm usually on a canoe or in a tent or <laughs> some sort of place like that with, that with my kids. So... <clears throat> With user experience work, I find myself in a, a number of different settings. Up, up at the top there, I do a lot of uh, strategy work. I do a lot of work with uh, helping uh, companies create user personas and customer journey maps, relating those to uh, not only their business, but uh, their users, trying to connect those together so we can craft effective solutions together. And then I also do a lot of uh, wire, wire framing work, and interaction design as well. And I also do quite a bit of user research. Um, that's me on the far right. had a project recently where I was helping to design a, uh, a concept for helping railway workers that are working on a railroad line uh, be safe. So it was iPad based, set up your own network. Uh, my co-workers were very jealous. I got to spend an entire day riding uh, a train next to an engineer. Wearing my high vis vest, of course. I get to spend a second day out with the work crew, with the foreman, checking out uh, the lines and the crews and the flags that they were using. So, the, the kind of work that we do in user experience, it takes you in a lot of different places. It uh, makes it kind of fun. Um, but what I want to talk about tonight is not just user experience, but uh, accessibility. And what I keep finding, uh, really over the last probably 10 years or so, Accessibility keeps coming up, it keeps becoming a part of what I do. And uh, I was just telling someone earlier tonight, uh, I've been through a couple of these wars, if you will, or battles where a company is under threat of litigation or they now realize, wow, we have to do something about this. And I'm learning the jargon, I'm learning how this all goes, and so it's a little bit about what I want to share. And so why accessibility is important uh, all sorts of companies are finding themselves under the threat of litigation. I'm just going to cite one recent example. Um, Peapod <clears throat> uh, settled with the Department of Justice around um, ADA violations, which were essentially they were found in violation of not providing full accessibility for people with, uh, with disabilities. I'm not going to read the entire settlement agreement <laughs> to you here tonight. Some of the things I did want to highlight, though, uh, they were required to make their sites and their apps conform to WCAG 2.0 AA compliance. And they were also required any third party that was providing services to them, they also had to be WCAG 2.0 AA compliant as well. They needed to solicit feedback from their customers <coughs> that had disabilities. Uh, they need to contract for and perform third-party evaluation and consultation. They need to perform regular automated uh, conformance testing. They need to train all their staff, including new hires, on accessibility. And any uh, issues that were identified, they had to fix them within 30 days. So <clears throat> from my experience, this is fairly standard. It's pretty par for the course when uh, a company is approached about accessibility issues. Um, what they're required to do is, is very similar to this uh, 
type of scenario. And I, I just have a couple companies here that have been cited over the last 15 years or so. It's a very long list. Um, oftentimes, it's, it's uh, an organization that really just wants the company to fix what's wrong. They're really not interested in money. They just want to know that you're going to take care of it. Uh, there are groups that do want money, and they are profiting from this. Uh, unfortunately, Target was probably one of the best known examples of a company that decided to fight their, um, their citation for being inaccessible, and it really gave them a black eye. It was all over the news, New York Times, so on and so forth. They had to settle, and it, it didn't go over really well for them. So <clears throat> out of all this, some of the companies that I've worked for, I've started to learn some of the jargon, some of the lingo. Those of you that are with Dennis's uh, accessibility meetup here, I'm going to bore you for just a second here, but forgive me for everybody else in the room. Uh, some of these uh, acronyms and some of these terms that are really important. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. And that really, in my in my from my point of view, that's sort of like the bedrock for how we've dealt with accessibility issues with technology ever since then. And it essentially guarantees uh, people with disabilities equal access. Uh, Section 508 kind of built upon that in the late 90s. was another uh, piece of legislation written by Congress that further defined, uh, in particular, around um, technology and accessibility as well. And WCAG is a series of guidelines. It's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That's sort of the, the watermark that everyone needs to hit. And so anybody that does consulting in this area, WCAG is always what they point to. And the guidelines were revised recently, a few years ago, and we're up to WCAG 2.0. And there's a couple different grades that they give out. There's single A, double A, and triple A. Um, most folks want you to aim for double A compliance. From what I understand, triple A is almost impossible to meet. Um, but double A is usually what people are held up to. <coughs> so with all of this going on, how, how are we supposed to respond to this? Well, with the, with the clients that I've, uh, that I've worked with, I've noticed a few patterns in terms of a typical engagement. Uh, there are uh, software programs that will scan your code and will highlight uh, areas where your code is in clear violation. For example, not having an alt tag for an image, not having field labels called out, so on and so forth. That's usually sort of uh, a ground level, make sure that that's done. Uh, a second thing that's typically done is a human evaluation. Uh, it's also uh, referred to as an accessibility audit. Uh, that's usually done by someone that has a development background. Uh, it's pretty well versed in accessibility in those WCAG standards, and they try and draw a line between where your code exists and where you're in violation. Uh, a lot of times they'll use screen reading software. Uh, the picture there is someone using JAWS, which is one of the more popular uh, software packages that people who are blind will use. Um, I find that in many, in many cases, the person doing that human evaluation is sighted. So they're, they're not exactly seeing it or hearing it, if you will, uh, from a blind person's perspective. But typically, this is done as just sort of table stakes. And it kind of moves on from there in terms of a prioritization exercise and what's going to be tackled. Uh, when I've been a part of these evaluations, we typically have had People doing those human evaluations deliver something that looks like this. It's a spreadsheet. It'll call out particular <coughs> issues by standard, what the description of the issue is, what the requirement is, and uh, how to mitigate against that. And so that becomes a conversation that's had between the consultant doing the human evaluation and the IT architects and the developers about what can be done, when it can be done, uh, in light of, of uh, everything else that's going on inside of an, of an IT department. <clears throat> so for me, I guess when I've been involved in these kinds of projects where we're trying to, in many cases, in a, in a panic, because we have a, a letter that's been sent out, 
there's a little bit of a, oh my gosh, we're under the threat of litigation, we need to get this going. Uh, the question comes up is, is that all we can do? And uh, for a lot of folks that I've, that I've worked with on the client side, they're happy just to be compliant. Just let's, just let's stop the bad news. Let's get out of trouble. I can tell the higher ups it's good. We're cool. Uh, what I've done, been a part of is um, conducting usability testing with people who have um, who have disabilities. So as an extra step on top of what I just described, you actually bring people in that have various disabilities. You have them use their hardware, you have them use their software, and actually step through the application, whether it's on the web, whether it's on a mobile device, whatever it might be. <coughs> and from that, there's uh, there's a great deal there's a great deal of value from that. Uh, to give you an example, this is one that I worked on not too long ago. I was supposed to find a financial services. Uh, advisor from the home page this woman that I had here in my usability lab she actually taught JAWS at a state school for the deaf I'm sorry for the state school for the blind and she was an expert okay so she's on the home page of our website here and she types in her zip code she gets this is just part of the page that's returned to her and so the map there on the left is read as an image, but an image that's not labeled properly. So she's inferring that it's a map. So a code scan would have said, hey, hey, right there, make that empty image tag, fill that out, call it a map. And you might feel that you've taken care of the matter. On the right is an invitation for you to narrow your search to get better results. So the way she was reading it with JAWS was, empty image, which is probably a map, then an invitation to narrow her search. So she automatically blamed herself and thought, huh, I must have fat fingered my zip code. And she went ahead and took that invitation to retype in her, her zip code and try again. When in actuality, this table was nested right underneath the map. And there were three folks that were financial <coughs> services representatives that were within, that were within three miles of her zip code. So the reason I bring this up is if you had done a code scan, like I said, it would have only caught the fact that there was an empty image tag for the map. If you'd done a human evaluation, if it was a sighted person, they might have missed this. A good one, a good person doing that would have caught it. But in many cases, these kinds, of, I call them interaction design problems or layout problems. They can really only be uncovered by bringing people in, they're actually using the technology. And I found that uh, over and over again to be the case. There's just a tremendous amount of value in adding in that extra layer of bringing in uh, those sorts of folks to run these, ty these types of studies with. So if I've piqued your interest in this, say, hey, maybe that Richard guy's onto something. Maybe I might want to try that. <clears throat> well, let's talk a little bit about logistics because there's a little there's a little bit to think about before you start to end up with this kind of thing. First of all, are you gonna do this testing at someone's house or where they work? There's advantages and disadvantages to that. Obviously, if you're gonna work with people with disabilities in their natural environment from an ethnographic point of view, that's a real win, right? You're in their natural environment, they're using their own technology. It's, it's, you're in their element, which is great. Uh, some of the challenges involved with that is you're going to have to do a lot of driving around or getting from place to place. I find typically when I'm doing ethnographic research, it gets a little bit on the creepy side <clears throat> if there's more than two of us. Uh, it gets a little bit on the Spanish Inquisition side of things when there's three or more of us in someone's cubicle or in someone's home. Like, who are all these people? So you're limited in how many people can tag along. Uh, you're also limited in terms of recording. <clears throat> a lot of folks aren't really interested in having you install software on their computer so that you can record your screen activity. <clears throat> so you're somewhat limited to, uh, to video at that point, which isn't 
a major obstacle, but it's something to consider. Uh, also, liability is a concern as well. Some companies just won't let you do that because that gets you're crossing the line. You're now getting into someone else's house, insurance, you know, what happens if the dog bites you, you trip over their, their couch or <laughs> whatnot. So sometimes that's just a non-starter. Uh, another possibility is to test in a formal lab setting, a usability lab of some sort, whether that's in your building or a rented facility. Uh, advantages and disadvantages there. <coughs> advantages. You're providing the hardware and software, so you have a lot more control over it. Uh, you're obviously able to set up the recording a little bit easier in that, in that case. Uh, so that's a win. Uh, other, some of these labs I've worked in, there's, a, there's mirrored glass. So you can have a whole host of people observing, and the uh, participant is uh, mindful of that, which is great to have as many people as possible checking these out as they're going on. <coughs> Uh, some of the some of the negatives are um, getting the person to your facility. Now, if you're on public transportation line, that's great. Um, if you're uh, you know, depending on where you're situated, in, it could be better in one case or the other. So, for those of you uh, that have done user experience work, if you've been a part of a usability test, the question can come up: Is how is this different from a typical usability test <clears throat> when you're running a usability test with sighted people on a particular application. Uh, I've found through experience you really have to uh, reduce your expectations drastically in terms of what you're going to be able to cover. Most often uh, you have a much smaller scope. Uh, you're only going to be able to get through a few tasks. It's a much slower pace. It's much more conversational and um, Depending on how buggy or inaccessible your software is, it could take quite a while. <clears throat> so um, what I've found is like if I recruit five or six people for a day and I have ten tasks to cover, I might have to split those tasks up amongst maybe two people at a time. I only get to do those particular tasks, which I know violates every usability paradigm out there <laughs> to only run. <clears throat> a couple tasks with two people, but you do start seeing the same thing over and over again very quickly. Uh, moving from A to B, so getting the person around. Uh, I've learned uh, from having worked with people in this community who are very, for the most part, very sweet and very forgiving of my mistakes. <clears throat> uh, there's sort of a protocol that you have to develop. So if you're going to meet the person, for example, out in front of your office and they're blind, you offer your elbow and say, would you like me to take you to where we're going? Please grab my elbow, and I'll grab the back of your elbow. And as you're walking, you have to describe where you're going. Say, we're going to go about 20 feet, we're going to take a hard right, and I'm going to open a door. So you're just describing the, the territory in front of them and what you're doing. So you're not grabbing their hand, which, but you're offering your elbow, and you're guiding them. <clears throat> That's, that usually works out really well. Uh, you do want to make sure that the doors of your building are wide enough to handle a wheelchair if you need to. Uh, find that out ahead of time. <clears throat> uh, there are service animals that are involved. If you're like me and you're allergic to dogs, that can become an issue. Uh, for me, if I just load up on medication, I'm good. I can make it through. I have had a service dog put his nose in my lap for the test which was a little weird, but we got through it. Um, and there's also another protocol on how you deal with the animal. Uh, you're really not supposed to scratch them between the ears and pet them like a, like a regular dog. That's a, a work animal. And they're specifically trained to serve the person they've been assigned to. And when you interact with them in that way, you're pulling them out of that, that mode, if you will. So you have to kind of keep your your distance on the service animal, even though a lot of times they're really awesome dogs and they're really doing amazing things. <clears throat> so just a, a few of the things to consider. Uh, also, if you have a facility in your building, it's best to clear this kind of thing with uh, your security people or whatnot. Hey, you know, I got these half dozen people coming in today. 
Some of them might have service animals. Uh, keep an eye out for them. Uh, in terms of finding these participants, um, there are local National Federation for the Blind chapters all across the United States. Those are a great place to start. Uh, there's a lot of special interest groups that use uh, assistive technology. Uh, universities, particularly the larger ones, are a great place to go. Uh, most of the universities and the governments have been under much stricter rules around accessibility for a much longer period of time. And so most of the larger universities have an office for accessibility with staff that helps um, train the different departments on how to make their websites and mobile apps accessible. Uh, most of these universities also have computer labs on site with all the technology they need. Uh, and so they can definitely point you in the right direction as far as finding folks. Uh, unfortunately, I've found that the uh, unemployment rate amongst people with disabilities is extremely high. So usually um, having them come and help you is usually not um, a huge barrier in terms of them not being interested. Uh, there's also, uh, amongst the community, I've found out there's a lot of um, positive energy. They want to come in and they want to help you fix your stuff. They really appreciate the fact that you're reaching out to them as well, uh, which is really great. Um, there's a project that was on a few years ago where we partnered with a local university. Uh, it was great because I brought in some middle-aged folks <clears throat> to my lab that had uh, uh, accessibility issues, and they were using uh, screen reader technology for the most part. They were also using screen magnifying software as well. And then I partnered with this local university. The university was really well known for being open to uh, people with accessibilities in the student body. And we had several of their students step through the same website as well. Uh, what I wasn't anticipating was it almost wasn't a fair fight <coughs> because the blind students, when they came into that university, they had a introductory JAWS course and they came out of that uh, screen reader course with just like superpowers. Mm -hmm. They knew all sorts of power moves and different uh, power user techniques. There wasn't anything we could throw at them that they couldn't master. Whereas a lot of the middle-aged folks that I was dealing with, they were more self-taught. And uh, what I've also discovered through that and other projects is a lot of times folks, um, this hardware and software isn't cheap. And so if it works, it's good. I don't care if I'm a couple versions behind sort of thing. And whereas the, the students in that lab were just there on the latest software. They knew all the stuff. And what actually came out of that was an interesting discussion I had with the professor I got hooked up with there. His grad students and I worked on a, uh, a sort of a separate exercise <coughs> where we uh, were essentially evaluating someone's proficiency with with the job screen here. So we're trying to place them as beginner, medium, and advanced, and trying to see what issues were uncovered through that, uh, which was sort of a separate effort, which is a whole other discussion. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure quite how that relates to anything involving compliance, <clears throat> but it was just sort of an interesting side take on all that. So what I did want to do, though, is I uh, did want to show you an example video. Um, this is a spoiler alert. It's only a five-minute video, but I'm going to tell you how the, how the story ends. <clears throat> so uh, there's a, a friend of mine, and I'm having him step through a newly redesigned website at The Ohio State University on uh, seeking financial aid. And they had recently had a vendor come in, and the vendor was very well versed in accessibility, <clears throat> and they redesigned it with that in mind, and it works great. And then at a particular point, he's interested in a particular scholarship, and he goes to uh, another website, and that's not so great <laughs> because that site hasn't been given that sort of treatment. So let me uh, cue that up for you. Let me see if I can get this to go. Yeah, we're doing that. We go.
Student financial, student financial aid, the Ohio State University Mozilla Firefox. Student financial aid, the Ohio State University document. Header, tab control. Securely submit forms, tab two of three. Earn money while in school, tab three of three. Navigation landmark, skip to main content link. The Ohio State University visited list with six items help link. Buckeye, map, fit, find people link. Webmail link. Search Ohio State link. Out of list banner landmark, main landmark, the Ohio State University visited link. Student financial aid visited link. Search grouping. Search student financial aid added. Blank. Navigation landmark, search landmark, search button. Incoming freshman submenu, one of seven. So, a little bit more background here. He's using a screen reader. It's highlighting in red where his area of focus is. He's a power user. <clears throat> He's a developer as well. And he purposely slowed down the speed of the screen reader so that I could understand it. <laughs> uh, a lot of these folks that are really practiced in the speed reader, I don't know if it's because one sense is shut down, the others become heightened. But it's reading it so fast, it just sounds like mumble. <laughs> but he's purposely slowing it down for me. And he's just to give you an idea, that's about 40 to 50 words a minute. <coughs> yes. And many users run at about three to 400 words. Yeah, so he's being cool with me at this point. So many want to send. Campus change student submenu two of seven. Transfer student submenu three of seven. And then I want to look under that. Heading. About a transfer students with four sub items one of four. File the FAFSA one of four. Cost of attendance two of four. Types of aid three of four. Resources four of four. And I'm looking for resources. So I can very Heading. easily apply for a transfer students with four sub items two of four. Navigate through all of these. Resources four of four. Resources transfer students the Ohio. Yep, so I'm just using the arrow keys to navigate um, through that menu once, I, once I've landed on that, that kind of large mega menu okay. control. And so you're going to go ahead and search for the different types of aid available? Banner landmark, main landmark resources, transfer students, heading, contact us and forms submenu 7 of 7, heading. Forms 1 of 2, polish, forms, heading, Forms one of pop. Search grouping. Search student financial aid. Navigation landmark. Search landmark. Search incoming freshman submit. Heading. File the FA. Net cut. Resource. Heading. A important date. Step by to do link. Apply. Heading. Accept aid incoming. Heading. Apply for aid. Heading. About aid. File the aid. net cut. cost of attendance three of five. Types of aid four of five. Types of student financial aid incoming freshman. The Ohio State University. Navigate. Somebody incoming freshman. Content info landmark navigation banner landmark main land incoming incoming freshman students step number two or in, incoming freshman submenu one of seven current and campus change stu, transfer students submenu three of seven heading about a transfer students with four file cost types of aid three of four types of student financial aid transfer students the Ohio State University navigation landmark heading level two Ohio State nav bar banner landmark main landmark types of aid transfer students heading level one heading level one transfer students link transfer link students link students step number one Link about aid. Main landmark navigation landmark scholarships heading level 4 link. Link A scholarship is financial aid that does not have to be paid back. Grants heading level 4 A grant is financial aid. Loans heading level 4 loans are financial aid that can. Private loans heading level 4 private loans are designed to assist students in their federal work study heading level 4 federal work study is a need based aid that must be a content info landmark the Ohio State University. So where would you go from here? So if I say if I wanted to learn about one of these different types of aids, if I say if I was interested in Main private loans heading level loans heading level four link grants heading scholarships heading level four link scholarships transfer students the Ohio State University banner landmark main landmark scholarships transfer students heading level one heading level one transfer students link transfer main landmark special scholarships heading level two. So he's looking for a particular scholarship at this point that he wants to apply for. Carefully. Head at the university offers hundreds of special eligibility scholarships with a wide variety of eligibility criteria to apply each year. By the priority date of February 1st, the regional campus is heading level 2. Regional campus students can explore scholarship opportunities at Link Lima, Link Mansfield, Link Marion. Choose Ohio for scholarship program heading level 2. And I know this is a controversial topic, but I'm bringing it up anyways. This is one of the problems with embedded links because he can use a, a, a keystroke to just pull up the links on the page, but Otherwise, um, he has to read through all that paragraph to be able to get to the different ones. He's just reading through it. 
Straight up. Use Ohio for scholarship program awards Ohio colleges, universities, and their business. Partners that have developed innovative academic programs to recruit and re external scholarships heading level two. Many churches, professional, civic or service organizations, private pop list with four items, big future link. Bullet link college scholarships. Bullet that Ohio State does not post individually. College scholarship. So now he's heading out to an external site. Digging down. External down choose Ohio for scholarship program heading level two. The choose Ohio for scholarship. Start Choose Ohio here. first Ohio Higher Ed Mozilla Firefox. And no out of list search form heading level two. Main landmark you are here heading level two. Link home link agency initiatives. Heading level one choose Ohio first. Heading level one link Facebook. Heading level one link tweet. Heading level one link cuff. Heading level one link cuff. Heading level one clickable. Background. Link annual reports. Link Y stamp. Participating programs link. Program link. Resources link. List with four items choose Ohio first STEM academic majors link. Choose Ohio first 2016 RFP directions link. Choose Ohio first 2016 RFP scoring rubric link. Choose Ohio first 2016 RFP webinar recording link. No While buffering and downloading, <laughs> out of list heading level four choose Ohio first proposals for eight million okay. new jobs will be list with one items choose Ohio first participating programs link heading level two. I don't know how you choose Ohio first out of list heading level two link agency initiatives list with 20 items white bullet link three years. Um, it's probably in one of these pages somewhere, but yeah, that's, I mean, the front, the front page doesn't really make it super clear. Out of list quick links heading level two list with five items white bullet link up. So there's probably around 40 or 50 links on this page, and it's just overwhelming. So this is sort of the, the bad example. <laughs> For the most part, the first website was fairly straightforward, and it would announce you know, one of seven on the tabs, two of seven on the tabs. This one is just a gigantic link farm, and all he wants to do is find the, uh, the application form for it. So... <coughs> um, he could get through this, it just wasn't ideal, per se. So in conclusion, um, it's my belief that uh, usability testing with people with disabilities highlights issues that are difficult to uncover any other way. Uh, they highlight unique issues uh, that other methods just won't uh, address necessarily. And I'm, I'm not uh, dismissing code scans. I'm not dismissing human evaluations. I believe all three can work together and give you the best solution altogether. Uh, I'm also under the belief that when you focus on accessibility, ultimately it improves the user experience. If you saw the difference between those last two websites that we just walked through in the video, the first one had a much simpler UI to it. And any website or application or uh, mobile app that I've been a part of that's undergone an accessibility review, it tends to simplify the interface. It tends to strip out of many of the options. And all of those are tenets of user experience, whether you're a content writer, an interaction designer, a user researcher, those are all things that we can get behind. And so in my, from my standpoint, accessibility really serves user experience very well for all people. And ultimately, I believe that um, where this comes down to is whether or not uh, the client wants to be compliant or whether or not they're interested in delighting their end users, <clears throat> uh, no matter who they are. And I understand the reason to, to try to get out from under the thumb of a lit, the threat of litigation, uh, to try to get that off to the side. But ultimately, um, we do serve a larger population. and. Um, what I've also found is that it really helps uh, with client relationships. Uh, one last story. Um, I was working for a financial services company, <coughs> and they held a, um, a uh, the, pu the public retirement uh, funds for a very large state in the country. Uh, they were the custodian for that. 
And uh, for that individual state, there was a woman who reported strict directly to the governor, and she was in charge of accessibility. And she caught wind of the website that my uh, client had for the uh, employees of that state, the government employees, and she was not happy. She was very upset, and it was it was doing everything wrong that you could imagine. Not only for people who were blind, but everybody else in between. It was just not a good website. And when they came on site, and they saw the East Billy Lab, and they saw that what we were doing to try to help um, mitigate what was wrong, it really made a good impression on her from a client perspective, that we were going to that extent to try to make it right. So I'm not saying that's the only reason that you want to do this, to try to win over a client. But um, it really does show that you're all in when you do something like that, that you're really committed to making something as, uh, as usable, usable as possible for as many people as possible. <coughs> uh, and with that, I will open the floor up for any questions that you might have. Yes? Right. So Richard, could you, Richard? Yeah, could you just repeat the question? Okay, the question was, have I ever done remote usability testing with people with disabilities? Yeah. Actually, my friend that was in that video was going to do that with me here tonight. Okay. But what were you <laughs> um, he told me that most of the web conferencing software, Skype and the like, are not accessible. Yeah. So essentially, he needs to have somebody with him. His wife decided. Uh, he has friends that are cited. They would need to be with him in order to make that go. So he told me he'd be happy to do that, but then it all fell apart. And I wound up running over to his office this week and making that, <laughs> making that go. Because actually, the videos that I've done for clients, that's all under confidentiality agreements, so I can't show you. But it is possible. Uh, I just think it probably would take a cited person on the other end to help them out. Uh, if, if things didn't work out. I'm a big fan of remote usability testing uh, in general uh, because I find that I get better show rates. Uh, people are much less likely to bail. Uh, they're using their own hardware and software, which is great. I can see what their screen resolution is set at. Uh, if there's noise in the background, great. That's the way you're trying to get things done with whatever it is that you're using. Uh, but yeah, I think in, potentially in that case, uh, for someone who has visual handicaps, they might need a sighted person along with them as well. That's a great question. Yes? The number of testers is exactly the same, so if you just do informative testing, you just pop four or five people, and if you're doing something more or larger, you know, what are the typical sample sizes that you're looking at for tests? <coughs> uh, yeah, so the question was how many participants do you need? In, in general, there's a rule of thumb in our field goes back many years that you need a minimum of four or five people to see the majority of issues coming up again and again. Um, this is somewhat anecdotal, but I haven't found that I need quite that many. That typically if something's broken for the first person, it's broken for the second and the third as well. It kind of gets to that issue I, I brought up a moment ago about the proficiency that people have with the tool and whether or not they're over to able to overcome that, which I don't think any of the legislation deals with at all, whether you're making it accessible for people with X level proficiency or not, but that's a whole other can of worms for another night. Uh, I have found that usually after about two or three folks, we can usually see the same patterns. Yes? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Back um, when in your career did you begin accessibility testing? The question was, when did I begin accessibility testing? Um, I was working for a software division with an IBM, and my user experience manager at the time realized that we hadn't done much with that and said, here you go, <laughs> go do it. And I met this amazing woman, she was, uh, she was blind, and she worked in one of our offices, and what they had there at that point in time, what they had done was they pretty much said, have her look at it. 
have her look at it. So she showed up to work every day, and they just had her trying to use whatever software they were working on. And she would tell them what worked and didn't work. So it was very informal, but it was great that they were doing that. And yeah, that's how I got introduced to it. Um, I met some really amazing people. Uh, IBM has an accessibility center. Uh, they've spun out a whole consulting group out of that as well that does consulting with all sorts of companies around accessibility as well. Uh, they're very committed to it. Um, actually, I went with that woman to the CSUN conference. I was just talking to Dennis about this. There's this really great accessibility conference out near the LAX airport. <clears throat> and for many years, they had it in the same two, two hotels. And the participants wouldn't let them move because so many of the participants were blind and they knew how to get everywhere. I go down the elevator, I go 15 feet forward to the right, there's the bar. <laughs> and they knew where all the rooms were, they knew everything. And uh, yeah, I got to go with her to that conference, which was pretty amazing. And you get to meet Stevie Wonder there too, because he lives in LA. And they have an amazing vendor area. There's these amazing vendors that come in with these crazy futuristic uh, pieces of hardware and software for accessibility that are just mind-blowing. And that's what Stevie comes for. This past year at CSUN, Stevie was checking out a device that was similar to the Echo. So he was talking into it and listening to what it was uh, returning. Is that it was and his bodyguard was six foot six and about 400 pounds. Yeah. 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 I thought it was his bass player, but no. <laughs> Right. Um, so the question was around usability testing and what sort of metrics apply around learnability and uh, how those change. Uh, in other settings, I have used time on task and error rates. And I find that those don't apply quite as well. Uh, sort of the slower pace piece that I was talking about as well is you also need to allow time for them to get comfortable. So if they're coming into your lab, <coughs> they have to adjust the speed setting. They have to figure out how to use your mouse. There's a lot of things that aren't quite the way that they, they prefer it. And sometimes you're using a different version of the software. Um, so in general, with that plus the general speed of it, I feel like there's a lot of things that don't apply that I might use normally in terms of evaluating something. And it definitely tends to be much more conversational and much more informal. But as they're going through um, trying to complete different tasks, um, you're usually starting to see the same issues come up again and again with, uh, with the participants. I don't know if I answered your question. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great question. Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, when you're doing usability testing, yes. um, you talk a lot about users who are blind, but I know people with a variety of different types of disabilities can encounter different challenges. Do you ever extend usability testing to you know, people with physical disabilities or with hearing impairments or kind of a wider range? Of okay, no, it's a great question. The question is, uh, with usability testing, do you test with people that just have visual handicaps or also others as well? Um, that's a great question. Uh, to date, the clients that I've worked with have just made the decision for whether it was a good decision or not, that they could master the vast majority of issues if they focused on people who had visual handicaps. Whether that's right or not, I think that's open for debate. <clears throat> it would probably take a whole other hour presentation on that. Uh, but to date, those, that's been the, the focus. Uh, I have been working with um, some different clients as of late <clears throat> that uh, are taking a different tack. And I'm looking forward to trying to bring in people who have motor uh, issues as well. Um, I think th there's definitely uh, a whole host of disabilities that we could bring in. But I think with this current client that I have, uh, we're definitely going to need to address that. And what's great about uh, having a relationship with the university is those students, they span all those disabilities. It's a really easy way to to quickly find people that have a variety of disabilities that you can tap into. That's 
That's a great question. Yes? Um, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, so when you're talking with people uh, who have been in visual uh, you also um, do like four or five people on screen reader versus four or five people on magnifier, that kind of thing? Because it's different hardware that you use or different software? Right. So uh, the question was, uh, in terms of recruiting participants, do you split them up four or five with uh, a screen reader versus screen magnifier? Uh, I think a lot of it depends on your budget and the timing. Uh, to get through, obviously the more participants, the more money you have to spend, the longer it takes. Uh, what I have found in general is um, if I have code on a prototype, if it's already been released, if this is post-production testing, or we're very, really close to a production release, that's when it makes sense to bring in people who have screen readers. Uh, when I have folks, uh, when we're probably more in a, a validation stage where we have a finished visual design, that's when it makes sense to bring in folks that have the screen or the screen magnifying type issues. So I wouldn't necessarily bring ten people in all together, half of each, in one setting, I would try to space it where it most made sense. Because I'm trying to feed information to my designers and my developers to change things as rapidly as possible. And if I have something that's finished visually but not doesn't have code behind it, we can address that before we jump to the next stage. I don't know if that made sense or not. Um, yeah, okay. well, that's the last part answers another question I had during. Okay. Great. That's a great question. Yep. Well, my question is just some observations that you've been maybe making down through the years or even recently from the testing. Is there some like very popular patterns that we, we, we just sort of go on autopilot and incorporate in our websites that actually are a big obstacle or kind of slow things down that you can make us aware of? Um, like carousel, for example. Or, you know, are there certain patterns and certain things that we just seem to oh, are there you just put on a website that you get way ahead of Are there patterns that create obstacles for yeah. people with disabilities? Yeah. Um, what I've noticed, and some, something that someone shared with me from IBM shared with me as well that made a lot of sense, and he shared this with me about 10 years ago, and I think it's still true, because I just had a conversation with somebody this week about um, uh, the developers on the team are falling in love with this uh, framework from Facebook called React, and they feel like they have to develop in that in order to get the most talented developers to work on it, and to get the, the cool factor with what we're developing. But when I bring in my accessibility consultant and we're working together, it just forces uh, the code that comes out of it is inaccessible. And so what I've seen play out over and over again is the technology leads the accessibility catches up, and by the time you figured it out, we've already moved on a generation or two ahead. For example, when Flash came out, that was the deal. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could demand $100 an hour if you could develop cool things in Flash. And so, tons of hours and money were spent to make Flash accessible. Does anybody care about that today? Mm -hmm. No, we, we're a couple generations past that now. We've gone to HTML5. Or, Twitter bootstrap, we're in React, we've moved past it. And so it's this constant catch up where the technology gets out in front and then finally we figure out the accessibility and we've already, that's more of what I've seen. Is that it's just really hard if you want to develop in the latest and greatest technology to make that accessible. Yeah. Would you say that there is a framework that's more accessible? <coughs> um, so I'm just wondering if there is an alternative that is considered to be more accessible. I'm not a coder, so I'm probably not the best person to ask. But I do know that if you are going to make something just locked down tight, accessible, you're you're giving up. Typically you're giving up a lot for the sighted community. And there, it's there's, a trade -off. there's it's been articles recently, if you Google articles on uh, frameworks and accessibility, They've actually done a rundown. Each framework has its own issues, but the general problem is 
especially when you're dealing with uh, custom code, custom elements and such, you know, if you have a form button, it has everything you need to do what you need to do. If you create your own button using custom elements and such, you have to bake that stuff in. You have to bake in what it communicates to assistive technology, uh, how it acts when you use a keyboard. So there's nothing wrong with frameworks, but just know that depending, there's an overhead uh, for accessibility. Yeah, and I think Facebook, for whatever it's worth, they were probably ahead of everybody else on making React accessible. So my client is now making calls to California <laughs> trying to figure it out. Because they have accessibility people on staff, and they're obviously doing something beyond what the run-of-the-mill folks are, are doing already. Okay. Uh, what advice do you have for a young designer who may not So the question is, how can someone uh, work with a company that isn't ready to take on accessibility in a true forthright way? Um, I've definitely been in that situation. I was telling someone earlier, I worked, I did some work for uh, an insurance company, and the breadwinner there was auto insurance. And myself and some other people that were trying to get things going around accessibility, we were laughed at because they said blind people don't buy car insurance. <clears throat> that's fine, but that's where all the investment was. And yet this company still sold renter's insurance. And so that code migrated down to renter's insurance. So if you're here, why not fix the mothership while you're fixing everything else, uh, in my mind. Um, so essentially, uh, we did a lot of work around making presentations, uh, showing what was accessible and not accessible, particularly around the things that are publicly available. Uh, that's how we got a chance to go work with that university. Uh, we were able to have those students uh, run against the website uh, with screen readers because it was already outside the firewall. They didn't need VPN access. So we used that along with um, highlight reels to try and build awareness. And it wasn't until um, they got in trouble with uh, violation compliance letters and clients themselves being less than happy. But we finally started getting traction. So you're kind of laying the groundwork, if you will, waiting for the, the bomb to drop. <laughs> we got time for one last question. One last question, yes. Okay. Um, so my question is, so when does it make sense to bring in uh, users into the accessibility usability evaluation? Because like during you know the auto checks and like the unit evaluation, it seems like you can catch any mistakes. Right. So it's like, does it make sense to bring in someone else? Right. And then when you do run a session, do you conduct like a separate accessibility session, or you do bring in like one or two people with disabilities into a typical usability test mm -hmm. and just have them in that? Okay, so the question was, Go for it. <laughs> when does it make sense to bring in people who are visually handicapped for a usability test? And does it make sense to bring them in with sighted users as well? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if you are, obviously if you're in a compliant situation, um, I think it makes sense if if you were going to do that human evaluation, the code scan, to try and get yourself up to compliance as quickly as possible, I would wait until they try to fix the majority of those issues before we then try to test uh, with people who have um, disabilities. Um, in development efforts, I think it makes the most sense to bring in uh, people with screen magnifiers as early as possible when you have some visual comps. And you've got a visual prototype to show them particularly around uh, color contrast issues, <coughs> as well as um, once you have uh, functioning code that a screen reader can read to bring them in as soon as possible. Um, in terms of bringing them in with sighted users as well, uh, another technique that I've worked with some of my coworkers on in the past 
is something that we call garage band testing. And that is set up for an agile methodology because the problem with, or one of the challenges with agile for a UX person is you're constantly spitting out small bits of work and you never have enough to build a whole usability test around until it's too late. <laughs> and so with garage band testing we would take different components of that that's coming out of the agile room and we'll run one participant against three small projects over an hour. So you're getting the feedback sooner. And I have experimented at that point, particularly if there's finished code, and bringing in people who are blind at that point as well to try and get the input there as quickly as possible. Because with Agile, hopefully you can throw your issue in sooner to get it addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to our presenter, Richard Douglas. Follow him on Twitter at Richard Douglas. Email Richard at Richard at ImprovedUsability.com. You can call Richard at area code 614-284-5150. Thanks to our venue sponsor, Critical Mass. Visit their website at criticalmass.com. Thanks to our beverage sponsor, Genesis Solutions. Visit their website at genesis-solutions.com. Thanks to our book giveaway provider, Rosenfeld Media. Visit their website at rosenfeldmedia.com. Thanks to Sticker Giant for our A11Y CHI stickers. Visit their website at stickergiant.com. Live captioning by Alternative Communication Services. Visit their website at A-C-S-C-A-P-T-I-O-N-S dot com. This event has been brought to you by the Chicago Digital Accessibility and Inclusive Design Meetup. Visit our website at meetup dot com forward slash a one one y CHI. Follow us on Twitter at A11YCHI. Visit us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash A11YCHI.